We are now awaiting reaction from President Biden to a landmark decision from the Supreme Court. Justices ruling six to three that colleges and universities must stop considering race in admissions, ending the decades old affirmative action policy. Hello everyone, this is Outnumbered. I'm Emily Campagno here with my co-host Kaylee McEnany and also joining us today, Martha McCallum, anchor and executive editor of The Story, Culture Plus co-founder and CEO Lily Gil Valletta, and Veterans on Duty chairman and former Army Intelligence Captain Jeremy Hunt. We begin with Fox News Sunday anchor and chief legal correspondent Shannon Bream. Shannon, good morning on this explosive day. Thank you so much for covering this all morning for us. Emily, glad to and glad that you always have attorneys there, including you on the panel <laughs> to help break these things down as well. Um, this is a landmark decision after many, many bites at this apple about what higher education can and can't do with the use of race. The court said essentially today it cannot be a factor in determining whether or not somebody gets a slot in a college. This involved Harvard and UNC, public and private university, but both take public money. And essentially, let me read you a little bit of what the chief justice said writing for the majority. He said here, the student must be treated on his or her experience as an individual, not on the basis of race. Many universities have for too long done just the opposite, and in doing so, they have concluded wrongly that the touchstone of an individual's identity is not challenges bested, skills built, or lessons learned, but the color of their skin. Our constitutional history does not tolerate that choice. He read from the bench, as did Justice Thomas with his concurrence, and the dissent as well by Justice Sotomayor. One of the dissents was read. Here's a part of what she wrote. The devastating impact of this decision cannot be overstated. The majority's vision of race neutrality will entrench racial segregation in higher education because racial inequality will, per will persist so long as it is ignored. Now, the court was careful to say, listen, if people want to write in their personal essays about the experiences they've had with social or racial injustices, um, their background, how they got there, where they came from, none of that is barred and no university is barred from considering that. They can't use those essays in a way to get around this decision, but they can certainly be part of the consideration process. Already reaction here on the Hill right across the street. At least one member of Congress, Hank Johnson, a Democrat now saying this demands that they expand the Supreme Court. It was a terrible decision. He's going to offer up and push legislation to do just that. Emily. Shannon, thank you so much. Bringing it back to the couch now. So, Kaylee, you contrast, as Shannon just read, the words of Sotomayor, which she essentially says it's the devastating impact which cannot be overstated. She says the court is not listening to the face of America crying for equality, yet Asian American entry in Harvard was capped at 20%. When you removed that cap, their own cap, all of a sudden numbers flourished. And interestingly, you combine that with the 82% of their population, of their student population, that come from wealthy backgrounds. When you talk about equality, that's not a box to be checked. And I can't help but remember Chief Roberts' quote from 2007, where he said, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Exactly. I would encourage every American to go read Justice Clarence Thomas's concurrence. It is fascinating. He puts this in the context of America's sins at our founding, of course, slavery, racial discrimination that we worked to get out of American society. He talks about the 1864 platform of the Republican Party was to abolish slavery. Republicans get in office. Republicans push forward the 13th Amendment. We get rid of slavery in this country. Uh, he calls it America's second founding. Then we get to Jim Crow and those horrific laws that were discriminatory in nature and Brown versus Board of Education where separate but equal is inherently unequal and we will not discriminate on the basis of race in our schools. And then he says, but we take some step back, steps back as a country when you get to the Grutter case, which allowed discrimination on the basis of race in school so long as you were discriminating against uh, individuals who were, let's say, Asian, for example. Um, so it's fascinating. And he finally concludes by saying, yet the Constitution continues to embody a simple truth. Two discriminatory wrongs cannot make a right. The Constitution prevails. Someone like John Wang, who had a nearly perfect SAT score, 4.65 GPA, um, does it, way above MIT and Harvard, doesn't get in. And he's put into a model. And because of his race in this model that he was put into, uh, they concluded, I'll end with this, he had a 20% chance of getting accepted into Harvard as an Asian. He had a 95% chance of getting in as an African-American, not equality. Martha. 
You know, um, one of the things that I found interesting was Justice Sotomayor's argument that there is structural racism, essentially, in the country. And, and I think that's a conversation we've all been having a lot in the past year or so, um, about whether or not this exists in the country. And you've got, you know, one faction saying, of course it does, and it should, it should affect everything we do, and another side saying that it doesn't exist. And I was listening to Tim Scott earlier, and I thought about the conversation that he had with the women on The View, uh, where they said, no, 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 you're the exception. So they're desperately trying to make sure that that construct stays in place, right. right? You cannot say everyone has equal opportunity in this country, because if you do, then you're going to lose the structural racism argument in this country. So I think it's a fascinating day. And I also think it's so interesting that what prompted this was that one group started to advance because of their hard work. And then another group tries to quash them down, right? Too many Asian students getting in, not enough. So once you had those boxes, and I remember them when I applied to college, check the box that you applied to, right? Which group are you in? You created identity politics in a, in, in a large way. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating about Martha's explanation as well, Jeremy, is the fact that for those proponents of affirmative action at the time when that original case came out, they expressly said this will not unnecessarily quash others. Mm -hmm. Remember that? It said it was to equalize anyone at a natural disadvantage, but never at the, the negative effect for anyone else. But exactly to Martha's point, it had the real-time effect of, for boxes only, absolutely quashing a considerable group that, by the way, is a minority in this country. Mm -hmm. So for affirmative actions, again, touting that it's the, that is there for minority enrichment and minority success and equality, it was having an opposite effect, which seems to be ignored by the left. Oh, that's exactly right. Look, I, I fundamentally believe, I, I, I do not believe that new discrimination today can somehow remedy discrimination of the past. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And if you look at affirmative actions track record, it's, it's actually quite abhorrent. Poor and working class black and Hispanic families are worse off today than they were during the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. and, and why is that? Yeah. Because policies like affirmative action benefit rich elites. That's what the policies are for. If you look at Harvard, in, in this particular case, 71% of the black and Latino students at Harvard hail from the wealthiest families in America. Wow. Mm. And all the while, you look at the educational opportunity outcomes for poor and working class blacks and Hispanics, and they don't even get a shot. And so, you know, and even my own personal you know, story, I, I grew up in Georgia in a middle class family. And I remember when I got to high school, I decided that I wanted to go to the United States Military Academy at West Point. It's always been my dream. And I had two JROTC instructors who told me, look, we believe in you, you can do this, but you're gonna get in on merit. You don't need any kind of affirmative action. We are gonna work with you every day to achieve your goal. And literally from freshman year to senior, senior year of high school, they would, it was academic and physical, you know, physically pushing me to, to get to those benchmarks and so I push-ups sit-ups running miles after school <laughs> education I had to make sure I got the top scoring uh, grades and I had those mentors that believed in me and I was able to get in based on merit not based on the color of my skin and that is something that we lose with policies like affirmative action so I'm thankful that the Supreme Court got it right today and a Yale Law graduate Emily, I can relate as an immigrant, first one to graduate of an American university in my family. It, it's about merit, but uh, here's the tricky part about this too. What gets measured does get done, and you do want to put a spotlight on education as the greatest path to equity, so I want us to support that. But here's what's fascinating with our country and the demographics of it. We are already majority minority at the elementary school level. That means it's gonna be a point when that will be the mainstream of students anyway. So we should be pointing our affirmative actions towards making sure that those kids that are said to be the majority of Americans in the future leading us as professionals, as politicians, et cetera, are not failing and that is sadly what's happening today. Black and Hispanic kids have fallen behind, even more so after the pandemic. So how do you expect us or our communities to be ready to go into Harvard or any other school with or without affirmative action? We need to focus on results and the support systems, the coaching, the mentors like those that told you, work hard, Jeremy, you can do it. Same thing for me, learn English, you'll get it. I still try to learn it, I'm still working on it, but you can do it. So I think we need to reimagine what equity in a fast approaching majority minority nation will look like, and it's a good challenge for universities now to rethink that. Yeah, and, and that's looking at, what, I'm sorry, looking at the national test scores for kids, little kids, we're failing them exactly. miserably. Yes. So address the college problem, but you better address that public school problem as well, and nobody talks about it from the White House. That's right. Hey everyone, I'm Emily 
Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.